Oh, All right, you listen, realize. Nedrick, you get your inhaler. Gendry, take a fucking Xanax, <laughs> okay? Jesus, boys. What up, and welcome to another episode of Brotherhood Without Manners, your favorite full spoiler reread podcast of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series. I'm your favorite host, Nate, and sitting next to me is... This guy. You can't get to me today. I'm Zach. This is this douche, Nate, that you know and love. But he can't bother us today, listeners. You know why? Because we have a guest. A very, very special guest. I'm so excited. I can almost not get through it. So, Nate, I think you should... We've been teasing it for weeks, and so we are pleased to have join us for the first time Chloe from At Girls Gone Canon. Welcome, Chloe. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Nate and Zach. I'm so excited to be here. I, I really am. I think we're going to... There's going to be shenanigans in this episode. The, it, mm-hmm. It's going to get a little a little brutish around here. Yeah, we'll do so. full disclosure. This is Zach's favorite A Storm of Swords chapter. Um, this is one of the basis for my theory of Arya possibly being a candidate to blow King's Landing in the Endgame. So can we at least give the header that we're supposed to give before? I, I know you're I joking. know, I know, I know, yeah, go through the spiel. At the top of the episode, we do like to warn everyone, we are full spoiler. We will ruin this series for you and not give a shit. So and we have please. Chloe here, too. And Chloe's so here to help. She'll help yeah. spoil She'll everything. spoil it on a deeper level than we can probably comprehend. <laughs> uh, Zach couldn't, True. anyway. <laughs> so... We, uh, yeah, we were reading last episode, Danny Four. Danny Four. And so it was pretty cool. She she met Dario Naharis, but I don't really like Dario all that much right now because he's, he's all grandeur. and He's, he's so much showier age. in the books, too. So it's, yeah. uh, Good it's for him. Interesting... He should be. <laughs> True. That, that forked beard, man. Look at who he's with. Like, he has to hang out amongst Barristan and Jorah. Of course he's going to be everything and more. Let's True, it is an elite. It is an elite. An squad elite squad them, he's yeah, with. Yeah. But uh, we're not reading Danny, so uh, nope. we're gonna jump right ahead. We're reading Arya eight today. My favorite chapter in a Storm of Swords. Last we left Arya, though, she after witnessing the trial of the Hound in between the Hound and Beric Dondarrion, the Hound obviously won, and Beric Dondarrion was restored to life by Thoros of Mir and his little posse. And following that. The Hound returned pissed because he wanted his motherfucking gold, and he was going to get it. And they didn't have it anymore because it was sent to buy support supplies, horses, and men for the Brotherhood, and the Hound was not pleased about this. Marked each of them very seriously, taking in their faces and just getting to know each one real good like. And he left, and then Arya ended up uh, just... Chillin'. Chillin'. Uh, <laughs> there was a specific point I wanted to make about something that happened in that chapter, but it just flew out of my head. So Shocker. Now we're on Arya 8. Yes. The good Your one. favorite chapter. Mm-hmm. Here mm-hmm. you go. Now you can go in like you were intending. So Arya 8 opens up pretty quickly with Arya seeing the hill. High heart. High heart. It's just a massive monument as they're approaching. So I... I like that right off the bat. She's already able to recognize it from one visit, and they make their way up. This is such a good chapter to be recording right around Halloween, because High Heart has such a spooky old cemetery feel, even though there's not a single grave to be seen. It's just this... It's ominous, and it's so cool to see it towering above, and, and this first image we get of it from Arya from the distance, it's... It's on the horizon. It's it's imposing. It's like the wall. It's but it's just a natural formation. And then of course they're making camp at the top, which yeah. is what you do. That's where it's easily defended. What a line, and, right? The it's haunted. The ghosts she remembered. High heart mm-hmm. is haunted. Like just to open it. And I mean something about old things, right, is creepy as hell. Like John, two chapters ago, right before Danny, that you guys just did the John chapter, right? He goes through Queen's Crown and he sees mm. all the old things. So it's just like a spooky part of the book, which is obviously perfect. Uh, which for the I'm Red glad Wedding. you mentioned because I was saying that to Zach that this cluster of chapters, like this group of like six, are they've just stepped up. George stepped up the intensity from the previous three quarters of the mm. book now that we're hitting this last part of it and he just foot to the pedal just puts it down because 
like you said right before that obviously is the the brand mm-hmm. chapter where he's also in the tower the first time he's making that connection with hodor mm-hmm. yeah. and that's that's a creepy unnatural not okay. moment it's, it's not bad. okay Bray. Faramir is gonna whoop your ass one day if you nah, don't settle Faramir. down let's, so let's Faramir not ain't shit Faramir. come on now he's disgusting <laughs> thank you yeah no yeah. He's, he's an abomination he's uh, the abomination not Bran God. well Bran has like a chance still right and Arya too I think that's a big thing because we have Arya who's close to all these themes of vengeance and the past in the last here chapter and the next cat chapter isn't that old stones it's what, Cat 5 next? 6? Mm-hmm. You guys yeah, are at? Yeah. So Old Stones. So the connection here for High Heart with the Ghost of High Heart, Jenny's Ghost of High Heart, oh, and right. Old Stones oh. coming up for Cat and Rob and the haunted kind of like doom of Rob's campaign. Uh, it all flows super well. This is a Halloween book. This is mm-hmm. a perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You And you brought up at the, the beginning that the, the ghosts that she mentioned is haunted here. This entire chapter is about ghosts. It's about the ghost of Ned Stark. It's about the ghost of Ashara Dane and, and the effects it has on the world and how these ghosts travel with us. Theon in Winterfell mm-hmm. thinks of his ghosts and all the ghosts that haunt him. It's a, it's a recurring theme that happens through the books. Arya just happens to be with a titled ghost, the ghost of High Heart, the, the one who gives prophecies, who is this creepy little woods witch who's dreaming and has this enormous aura of grief and loss about her about her and it's oh it's just magic george is such a phenomenal writer especially in these where it's more the feel of the chapter is what's supposed to grab you than at what what is actually occurring it's it's the vibe it's the there is a magic in this world. Mm-hmm. It's 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 slowly ebbing or coming back, which yeah. depending on so where you are. So speaking of that magic, I like that you mentioned that as we get. The next scene is Thoros sitting in front of this fire, not seeing anything, as we'll learn from the ghost. For some reason, he can't hear, whether it be because the fires destroyed the area around and the North remembers and the old gods and all that jazz, or if she's, mm-hmm. you know, putting wards around the fucking property to keep it clean from the, you know, <laughs> consecrate this place, make sure no evil enters. But we get the uh, uh, adorable little scene of Arya and Ned, oh, my heart, oh. walking this circle of werewoods, and it's just, I, I just love this moment for Arya of, like, what a what a feeling of home of these werewood stumps, Ned, and it's just oh this... My God. Look, we're going to have to cover it now off the bat. Ladies, gays, theys, thems listening at home. I got to tell you that these boys are going to go at it today. Because in one corner, we have the Ned and Arya shippers. And in the other, we have the Gendria shippers. And it's getting a little violent. It's starting up. It's going to go down. I'm mediating. Let's go. Let's do it. Yeah. Ned is so cute. He's so, like, fuck See, Gendry. You only like it because she can't walk around with the real Ned in a forest oh of werewoods God. ever again. I, boys, I boys, don't... boys. <laughs> <laughs> don't shit on Eddard to get uh, Edric. Eddard kind of okay. shits on himself all Sir? Long. I don't need to help all right, him. All right, there. all right, all so, right. Yeah. Uh, well, let's Ari talk about notes... that also. Edric, right? His name, and he was named because of. Y- your boy Ned, right? Mm-hmm. So that feels very prominent. The Weirwoods, all that. I mean, it is kind of like a little another marriage ceremony. Arya's out here marrying other boys in front of Gendry. Right, right in front of his eyes. Like, watch Dang. it, bitch. Uh, Dang. Good for Arya her. notes a, uh, <laughs> a storm raging in the north, which I think is interesting considering the storm that is surrounding Jon Snow and Bran currently where they are. Just this... One, the actual rain that is coming down while they're doing their thing, but also the storm that is coming, the wildlings, the others, and just all of that. I think it's a, it's interesting that Arya I looks mean, north and sees it turbulent, these these awful looking clouds of like, oh shit, that looks pretty fucked up up there. And even not as far north that the, the fucking right, red wedding's not, coming as true, well, yeah, like true. right there at the twins. And so, you know, that's and a, the river a storm that they're going to be seeing. Yeah, right there in the Riverlands. It's... The war is already nasty there. everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Even the description throughout the book of like the waters, like when you get to the Catalan chapters, you know, when they're trying to cross the fork and they're like losing horses and men. Mm. It's like not a, a good rain. It's not like a summer and spring on the East Coast kind of rain that just happens all the time. <laughs> like it's like times 10 flash floods. It's nuts. But they have fire yeah. at least, right? Still like they still have the flames as Thoros and Beric are looking into. 
keeps them warm and toasty. And uh, that's when Ned starts explaining to Arya that he looks in the flames because he can see things, see visions, which is essentially the first confirmation or other than from Mel that people can do this, that this is a thing. And Stannis. And, well, and Stannis, <laughs> but they're still from Davos's point of view. Sure, yeah, and yeah. so to see it from this point of view, granted, I find Arya a little bit less reliable as the narrator than Davos, because mm-hmm. Davos has a little more wizened thoughts than Arya might at but this that's point. But inten- that's intentional, right? Obviously, of it's course. It's more yeah. mystical through the eyes of the child. It's more, this and is straight magic as opposed to this is... I think that that's what what Martin's going for here is he's giving us Mm -hmm. this. No, you have way more reason to believe Mel's magic is possible once you start hearing that. And to mention he's foreshadowing Hermes reading the flames Mm -hmm. because Thoros will later on in the chapter mention how, you know, I can I can misread the signs and the visions, but I do see them. And it's one of the first times we're kind of seeing that Mel could misread. Granted, we did get some of that in Davos's mm-hmm. last chapter um, when he was named Hand of the King. Mm-hmm. She mentioned, like, with the Battle of Blackwater, how she wasn't present. She kind of misread some things. Oops, my bad, guys, but it's all cool. <laughs> well, and he also, like, Beric and Thoros, there's such a distinction that Thoros is like, I am a tool for the Lord of Light, mm-hmm. right? Like, there's a very... Right. And Melisandre says that, but her actions in the beginning, we don't necessarily, without her POV or perspective, think that way of her, just because, you know, she's kind of a shady character. Mm-hmm. No pun intended with, you know, all the shadows and the binding and shit. But, like, <laughs> uh, Thoros, he's kind of, you know, you get him at the front broken down because he was just this fat, drunk priest when you meet him, right, that likes to fuck, fight, and drink, which who doesn't? Mm-hmm. But then you have these lines of Beric, who, I mean, it is very Stannis and Melisandre, right Beric has become a broken man quite literally over and over again and Beric comes behind Thoros and he's like talking about fire he says fire consumes it consumes and when it is done there is nothing left nothing and it's just the I have chilling. that quote written down too oh it's so Goosebumps. chilling yeah, yeah it's yeah. he's so bitter he's so bitter about it six fucking times Thoros six times is too many it's too many. He doesn't like, even want it anymore, right? Like, yeah, he's, no, this isn't I, worth I, it. He, he's forgetting. He doesn't know who he is. He can't remember where his own keep is anymore. I had a woman once. I couldn't tell you what she looked like. These things are starting to fade. And when you have that loss of humanity, what is left? What is the point of coming back if you can't remember the things that you're fighting to save or defend or die defending? It's awful. It's so, so tragic. Now, with this chapter coming so close before the the red wedding and Catelyn's rise as Stoneheart is is she inheriting that seventh breath or is she getting to start the cycle anew where she she's still got a large portion of her memories or is it that seventh she only remembers the the slaughter inside of uh inside of Walder Frey's hall like that's what as she far back as it down goes there. because well, she's taking that seventh breath as we get to the ghost of high heart here we're going to talk about some of her visions right and I think we should definitely come back to that then because it, there's so mm. much there that talks about really what happened right the saddest part was the bells which is jingle bell when Catelyn mm. lost it all when she gave in to the grief that's been threatening to drown her for like two decades right Right. of her fucking and she's like 30 like so (laughs) we you know that's the craziest part for cat every time i read anything with cat now i'm like girl you're like 32 33 like you're not old you're a milf like you're Mm -hmm. fine as fuck miss cat what i love her her. milf in the north yeah back at the fire (laughs) with thoros now that we're out of his fiery well aria i love that aria immediately is like huh so she starts squinting and trying to look in to see anything but she can't she just makes her eyes water (laughs) which it's like that's such a you know a 10 year old thing to do of just like oh i can do it if i do it real hard so then gendry goads Thoros into revealing his backstory, essentially, saying that, you know, Tobo Ma said, you, you're you a piece of shit, man. You, you, you lit your fire, your swords on fire, and then broke them. Like, that was good seal. And he's like, yeah, I mean, he charged me twice what they were worth. But, yeah, no, I was a piece of shit, absolutely, <laughs> for sure. Uh, and, like, I like that. And so, yeah, we find out that he was the youngest of eight and sent out to the red keep because or to the red priest because why the hell not what else are you gonna do with him he's the eighth son like 
in all in Westeros, it makes sense. Mm. Like mm. if he didn't go there, you may as well make him a maester. He didn't or, fit. Uh, no, but he didn't fit into the seven. That's the whole joke, right? right he was forced exactly. out. Oh my god, poor poor guy. He was like, <laughs> no, nope, yeah. I am the red sheep of the family now. <laughs> Holy Dang. shit. And so he went over there and he raised some hell and got kicked out of the Catholic school. They were like, Those wicked girls. Go bug Westeros again. Like, (laughs) yeah, sure, bring them on board or whatever. But, like, just leave us the hell alone. See, I I think it would be interesting. I would really like to know Thoros' physical description when he was serving at the Red Temple because I find Thoros such an interesting reflection of the king he served, uh, of Robert. He becomes this fat drunk lax mm-hmm. we know he already had it in him he wasn't interested in the spells and the in the the chance he said them because he was tasked to but when he got to robert's rule in reign and served under him he kind of got to say like fuck the red priest nonsense i get to just live the way i want to now and and i wonder if that was always intrinsic or if he and Robert started playing off of each other and became these mirrors of each other, but just one's a priest, one's a king. Neither one is fucking hot, happy with their lot in life and hasn't been since. That's kind of his whole thing years now, right? right? Like that is like Robert is a poison to those around him. Look at Ned. Ned's acedia only grew as he like sat paralyzed by fucking Mm -hmm. trauma right in the north behind his gates because of robert like robert is kind of the cause for all these families to dwindle dawdle and fuck off for far too long uh i mean it was like that's why the big vacuum of power just was whirring for so long and i think you see that but also like that is what the brotherhood stands for and it's interesting because this chapter i think we get kind of the heart and soul of the brotherhood of these broken men who like not unlike some of the other POVs we see, they they were like, I'm going to follow the rules that my family tells me I should. I'll be a good lord. I'll be a good red priest. I'll do whatever they say. And they follow the king. You know, they uh, follow his rebellion or not. And here they are. And this is where it got them. And now they're just broken men in the fucking riverlands just out for vengeance and for protecting what small folk they can. It's interesting because it harkens back to... The, the, one of the last Davos chapters we read where Davos is made hand of the king and Stannis tells him every man it's their duty to follow their rightful king regardless of if their lord proves false and Davos challenges him and says as you did when Robert rose against Ares and it's that that interesting when you start breaking it down to the levels of lord liege lord bannerman who who's at fault when mm-hmm. things start going wrong? Is this happening because Ned Stark gathered these men together and sent them off to bring justice to Gregor Clegane? Or is it Joffrey's fault for killing Ned Stark and kind of setting them loose and giving them not really the the mission the the taskmaster kind of looming over them anymore there is no the hand that sent us out and so it where does the accountability fall and it always tends to fall in the lap of those with power these kings these lords that are playing this game of thrones that we all love so much how harwin's with them harwin's with them like right so we get the uh, that he was sent over to try and sway Ares, and the only reason I'm bringing this part up is again because just a couple chapters back we've got Jamie in the bathhouse and learned of all the caches of wildfire being placed throughout the city by the pyromancers, and he Thoros blames the pyromancers for not being able to sway Rolor because mm-hmm. they had better tricks than he did. They can make. Is it just because they can make the wildfire, or they got other shit? I think that it's that Thoros wasn't like Mel. He's not interested in the parlor tricks of throwing mm-hmm. the powder on the flames and making the big. You know, they could do that. That's what they were doing, and he's not interested in that shit. He, but it's also he, like know. Ares wanted immediate satisfaction of burning all of his enemies that he thought were like against him. Right, his paranoia like fire mm-hmm. consumed him. Where I think Thoros and Melisandre do have a fucking code to an extent. Hence, mm. Thoros is here. Hence, Melisandre's with Stannis. And, like, I mean, I can see that conversation going, well, that's not how this works, my lord. We need a couple leeches first, motherfucker. <laughs> you know, like, and Ares probably wouldn't have taken kindly to that. And also, mm. I mean, Thoros romanced Robert. Light, 
light all the swords of all their army on fire oh. all at once. Jeez. That would probably do. Yeah, it's it, it's that instant gratification versus Thor. You know, yeah. let's pray to Rolor and and he'll van- give you the the fires to vanquish your armies. And Ares is like, or I could just light everything on fire, and that sounds dope. And so, not to yeah. be controversial, but again, you guys just did the Danny chapter before this, where we talk about <laughs> Rhaegar and Elia and Jamie and what happened in the rebellion from what they know and what, you know, their group knows at the time. And she's learning some of these things she's never learned about her family. So that kind of, there's this like line running through this part of the book and this last half of the book where Mm. it's like history repeating itself. And like, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. And (laughs) for Arya, this chapter especially is like about the past, right? Because as we're about to see, we have some characters like Lem Lemon Cloak, who surely yes. couldn't be a man in disguise of any mm. caliber, and certainly isn't Richard Lawnmouth. Anyways, uh, but you know, you see, I just you see, I'm not I, alone. You're not wrong, and you're not. But like, it's got the past. It has what's happening now, and what will probably happen in the future for Arya, right? And she runs mm. from it. She runs from the past when she's confronted in it in this chapter. Mm. Absolutely, yeah, she does. Uh, this is where Beric, you know, is appears over them. Fire consumes, <laughs> and and I think I just couldn't help but think of the the Dwight Angela meme. Of, like, where <laughs> Dwight oh, there at the what bar the fuck? And, what the fuck? <laughs> Holy shit! All right, Beric. All right, maybe go <sighs> sit back up in the the hollow or something. See, I was kind of picturing him like the the. Um... Christian Bale Batman with the series like oh, rattle their cages. Oh yeah. Fire yeah, consumes. Right. I'm over here like Nemeria is just pulling Catalan out of the river and just yeets her out of the river and you have <laughs> Barrack dying and you have Thoros like save Catalan. <laughs> save Bandit. <laughs> That's that was one of my favorite things too. Is Thoros is immediately like, my dude, what's up? What's the matter, Beric? You okay, bud? They are very like romantic. Yeah, so oh, super. Romantic, I love dude. it. It's, I love it. And he's like, nothing I've not said before. Like uh, they're bickering like a married couple, but it's mm-hmm. about you resurrecting me too many mm-hmm. times. Like it's such, this weird surreal conversation, and uh, and then yeah, they all settle, go to bed. The wind. Howls like wolves and then a real wolf pack. It's so funny to me how uh. it feels like Martin is laying it on so thick here. With Nymeria. With the, the wolf mm-hmm. pack. But, like, those first rereads, I was like, oh, there might be some wolves out there just howling at the Don't moon. Don't go this too far cool. from camp, guys. Like, never really putting that together. Yeah, no, they... she, she, I mean, she's got to be around. She's, she's circling for Cat, you know? Mm-hmm. She's waiting. <laughs> waiting near that river. And, uh... The watch is set. Most people are asleep when Arya sees the little pale figure with her white hair flying wild on the wind. No more than three feet tall, eyes as red as John's wolf. Oh, my heart. He was a ghost, too. <laughs> where the fuck is she coming from, man? Dude. Like, where in the actual, like, where the is hills, she actually bro. coming She's from? She's living in the hills. Oh, yeah, there's a hollow. There's a hollow. She's under- got a hollow. Like, they literally Oof. just left a hollow of weirwood roots. That's where she is under here. Or she just, you know, opens each like stump. It. It's like a little, little pl- manhole <laughs> cover where she just pokes up. But what you said, like, what if she had... I never thought about that. What if she had laid protections on these weirwoods, especially since we had Jamie with his weirwood dream coming up. And, like, remember, he has the Brienne dream soon before he goes back to get her. Uh, and the Weirwoods, like you were talking about Bran with his Weirwoods around. That ring of Weirwoods heal, it, it, fe- it feels so magical, this ring of Weirwoods. Mm-hmm. And for her to be in them, like, she's where the magic is fucking nigh, dude. And they're, and they're just stumps, and we're told that that severs the power, yet it still feels so powerful here. Still and, gave and Jamie dreams when he fell asleep it, it, on it, one. Yeah, Jamie dreams, it can block Rolor in his connection to mm-hmm. the flames. So... It, this is a little crazy because of the traveling, but like I said, I like to do the tinfoil thing. Oh, we were talking God. about the the chapter where Arya sees the Hound fight Beric, and they're in that the where the Brotherhood's little tomb of. We were talking about how it's all right, white roots. Maybe it's right here maybe underneath. It maybe it's right here underneath High Heart. That's were, the roots of these stumps well, that we're seeing. It also those... makes me wonder: like, is she protecting herself from other seers, like Blood Raven, other fellow mm, albino yeah, seers, yeah, yeah, of by cho- by her weirwoods being chopped and staying there? I, I, it just Ooh. makes me think: like, does that 
take access away from Sears, maybe? Mm, hmm. Maybe. Yeah, they can't see through the eyes, so mm-hmm. she she has sort of dominion over this realm. I can tap into the power, but they can't see me. That's Could that's be. interesting. That's oh, real God. interesting. I like it. I do, too. So she sits uninvited, and uh, <laughs> I like I like the little nickname she has for Barrack, which is His Grace, the Lord of Corpses. Oh, but I also like the Ember and the Lemon as well, because uh, sure. you know all those extra nicknames for Richard Lawnmouth just adding up. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> it's please, true. George. Let's just identify more people just by their sigils only. Like, there's not enough in that in this chapter. <laughs> well, isn't it interesting that this chapter is all about people who are supposed to have been dead? Isn't that so funny? Mm, Do you that's, think? That's funny how that isn't works, that? Isn't you it? get me. That's At least funny. I have one friend so here. Funny. No, this is crazy. Look, how it just all adds it up. is him. I mean, it is. It's Richard Lott. I, it, Lady Gwynn from Radio Westeros wrote about this ages ago, like 2014, mm-hmm. right? Like that's like when I read that. Yeah, first was when it came out. She analyzed well. this to pieces. You guys got to check it out on her website. I'll throw you guys a link too. Uh, but yeah, yeah. We so the that. arms yeah, of Lawnmouth. Nate's been sending it to me for years, and, it's, <laughs> and you still haven't opened Lady, it. I love Lady Gwyn. I've I just have zero interest in Richard Lawnmouth, and uh, well, maybe that's here's that's a detriment to me. It, it is. could be a, a bad thing for me. I could just be. I think neglecti- you're really uh, closing your third eye. Myself. You're closing I your third so eye too. to the I'm story, and so All here's right, why: yeah. because the idea of Richard Lawnmouth, a, like, a C-list fucking rebellion celebrity, right? Like, no one thinks, like you said, who the fuck cares about this guy? But he's he joined on everything. to Robert's Rebellion, right? And the idea if he's alive and you have all these players from the rebellion suddenly popping back up, I mean, talk about the E-list members in fake Aegon's mm. crew, right? <laughs> like, you know they're people, but you they don't matter, is what I think. Right. They're not real people people like they are but they're gonna die all the same yeah Yeah. but they're like they're total c-list b-list celebrities they're not real people from the rebellion that we've learned about and lawnmouth was pretty close to everything right like he drank and fucked not with robert the fucking it was near robert probably like in proximity (laughs) of robert he fucked but he drank like with robert right he really was adamantly a pro robert guy and then you have his arms his arms are red lips strewn on yellow yellow skulls strewn on black quartered it's the connection of kisses and bones and yellow I mean, it's right. And here he is asking for kisses and there's wine and kisses kisses. and bones. I mean, uh, we're king's men, (laughs) on guy the archer says. Arya frowned, which king? King Robert, said Lem in his yellow cloak. (laughs) And you even have kind of like he was Prince Rhaegar's squire, right? At a certain point after Miles Mouton. Uh, and he's a Stormlands house. He got into a wine drinking war with Robert. We learned that in Brand Two in a Clash of Kings. So I just it's it's, it's pretty there. particular. I mean, can we talk about the male? Is what I'm saying. Like, can we just <laughs> can we talk about Pepe Sylvia All here? Right. So it literally just took anybody but Nate. So I will read that uh, as soon as we finish recording. Ah, he likes me. You, you, he you just so dislikes me. Don't give right. yourself too much uh, credit. And, and I, I very much <laughs> That could be very powerful is what I'm trying to say. It's a very powerful right. emotion, liking Good. me and hating Finally. you. <laughs> He's, needed He's needed this. <laughs> and so, yeah, uh, Beric does not, of course, like the name the Lord of Corpses, and she's like, too bad, dude. You, you stink like death. And, uh, <laughs> Shit. We'll... F- We'll find out here in uh, in just a couple lines that it might not be Barrack that is fresh death is the one that's smelling. I think she's covering that up with the just some emphasis to Arya, but I do think it because she mentions it's fresh death. Has she killed anyone recently? Arya, Mm-mm. like any no, more no. recently than he would have died. So like, I don't think that she's. I think she's just kind of throwing shade his, his her way there. Maybe but she's getting also, old. You know, I mean, right? True. Summer she Hall was a long time ago. Okay, uh, <laughs> a long time ago that everyone died except her. Okay, uh, everyone, <laughs> everyone fucking so died, dude. Of all of them. Everyone. <laughs> Shit. Everyone. Oh. We we learn what she wants for payment, yep. which is some wine and huh, a, ki- a kiss from All right, Nathan. Lem. Oh, Just, kisses? Mm-hmm. I know. Funny, wow. Funny. What, a, what could uh, it mean? Sloppy kiss. But she settles for some wine and a song. Just, she, wa- she, uh, she wants a sloppy kiss with a little bit of tongue, little which tongue. like, but you I know. feel like, recognize game. Yo, if, she, if she's going to be putting it out there, she may as well go all in. 
Like, you don't ask for all of it and then talk your way, you know, you, you don't start at the bottom and try and ask for more. You start for the whole <sighs> negotiation. And yeah. And maybe, look, maybe hot take, like, Westerosi Wonderwall, maybe it's that good of a song. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> She's lonely, bro. She's had a very lonely last couple decades. So maybe oh. Westerosi Wonderwall is, like, all she needs to get her through another couple decades. That, that I think we've... <laughs> Cracked it? You got it. I don't... I don't know what to do with that one. So yeah, she'll get wine and a song, and Barak himself hands her the wine skin, and she says, Ooh, sour wine for sour tidings. The Kraken King is dead, we learn. She had dreamt him dead, and then he died. And now the iron squids turn on one another. So there's a feast for crows for you. We don't need to read that book anymore. We're good. We'll put it away. The Prophet... Just kidding. No, Feast for, we, we know Feast for Crows is my favorite book out of all of them, but... Oh, wait, uh, but not Nate? Sorry, we have to... Let's back up a second. We gotta oh, hash this out. Question. What's going on Feast here? Feast is mine as well. Is, is Feast yours? Yeah, oh, okay. Feast has always been my Interesting. favorite. Interesting. Whoa, he's casting shade at me. He's just trying to throw me under the I bus I guess unintentionally, because I... Yeah, uh, no. I just, yeah, no. My wow. first read, no. I didn't my first time through. I didn't like it. Um, com- in comparison to the others, I still enjoyed it, but sure. it wasn't my. T- it was after my se- my second reread, my se- my first reread, my well, second read. Your second read, go. first reread. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, upon rereading the series, Feast jumped to the top of my list, and so we're we're okay. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. good. I was getting daggers thrown. Listen, my way. hey, Feast Ooh. is the best book. You're so clever That's to have magic. seen it. Agreed. Agree. I mean, I like. I don't think you're allowed to listen to our podcast <laughs> if you don't like Feast, because I just right, don't understand right. it. Pull it back. I just don't back. understand we're, it. We're an open accepting podcast here. They can. <laughs> they I mean, can like other uh, ones since as well. when? Like, <laughs> all right. Gonna... As long as they're agreeing with us. <laughs> so we get the the old news, the fake news that uh, Hoster Tully's dead. You already knew that. Rip. In the Hall of Kings, the goat sits alone and fevered as the great dog descends on him. So, you know, oh. sapphires aren't going to save you this time. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that one's pretty pretty cut and dry there. The, the, the mountain that rides is descending on Heron Hall, and the goat is going to be left there without his leech lord. Without anything, man. He's... Oh. He's going to be up Shit's Creek with, like, Jamie's going to go back and be like, yeah, we're taking everything, and so now you're just, now you're just here. Bye. God. I love this, because as she goes on through all these prophetic deaths, right, uh, Arya's trying to figure it out. She's like, does she mean Sandor? Mm-hmm. Does she mean Gregor? I mean, either. I, I could go for both, right? Arya's, like, fine <laughs> with either. Uh, but we get this line. She goes, maybe Lord Beric will hang them all, which I have two thoughts yes. about, right? First thought is... Uh, it reminds me of when Sansa's like, Rob will kill you all. Sansa thought, exulting. Mm-hmm. What a fucking line, right? Like, we love those Stark girls. Yes, we do. And oh, yeah. the second thing is how masterfully done this is because she thinks maybe Lord Beric will hang them all. But Beric's going to die. You know who is going to be hanging people all over Westeros? Mommy dearest. And then we get the Red Wedding visions in this next ch- paragraph mm-hmm. immediately. Yeah, Mwah. Right after Mwah. Chef's kiss. Oh, it's good. It's so sexily <laughs> done. And and the red wedding here is like the saddest part. Because like we said earlier, so I dreamt a wolf howling in the rain, but no one heard his grief. I dreamt <laughs> such a clangor. I thought my head might burst drums and horns and pipes and screams. But the saddest sound was the little bells. Because that's where Cat loses it. That's where... Mm. Her heart turns to stone, dude, as she kills Jingle Bell, who's utterly defenseless and innocent and did and could mm-hmm. do absolutely nothing wrong to her. That's all she had left. That, that's the desperation, yeah, right? Cracked. Yeah. Uh, make an end of it. Uh, and that, not my hair. But that's the saddest part hair. because that's not who she was. Mm-hmm. That's who she was forged into. Mm-hmm. That's who she right, was forged right. into by society and necessity and Walter Frey in this moment. And... Man. I've never before caught that, that she hopes Barrack hangs them all and it ends up being his predecessor, if you will, that ends up doing it. That's that's a well, fucking amazing. There's this thing. I don't know if you two have heard of it, but I have this little theory about little Miss Arya Stark. And I think that she's going to have to be the one to do the old <laughs> snip snip on her mom. She's going to 
kill her mom when she comes back to the Riverlands to say bye to her wolf. She's got to kill that part of her and let the woman be born, you know. And uh, <sighs> But it's going to be a mercy kill, right? Because even at the end, do you know where the heart is? You know, Do you know what wolves do to dogs? Uh, her mm. mom's not her mom anymore, right? And that right. tension dialed up to, like, that right there to me, like, those connections of just, like, her thinking, Barrick will hang you all, and then it being her mother is such a subversion also of, like, what a woman in Westeros does in Arya's mind. Mm. Like, her mom's out there fucking girl bossing, gatekeeping, gaslighting all day long, nine to five job, right? Killing Freys. <laughs> and Arya didn't know she could have that kind of job in Westeros. That could be really right. big for her. Mm. But also, she's probably still going to have to kill her mom and put her down, you know? Well, but. then she's also going to be running around with, because uh, Richard Lawnmouth jokes aside, Lem will be burying the helmet, assumed, of the hound. Yeah. So she does have a dog right there, you know, and she, she does say she's going to kill the hound. Uh, uh, it could be uh, Lem, because, I mean, that's the thing is, uh, not to go back to Feast Dance, but, like, because as we get them, we learn Ned splits off, right? Nedrick here splits off. He goes uh-huh. with the other group to go home to Starfall. And we'll probably see him as we'll get ahead with Ariel Hota or something. But mm-hmm. then you have the small faction that's still fucking going. And they're like, mm. some of them left because they didn't agree, but. Right. The uh, the ones that did have been just, they've been going carnal down there. It's just been nonsense. <laughs> some of them are like, them. drench me in fray blood, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which no hate, you know, no hate. I mean, if that's what you're into, who am I to kink shame? It, you but know, if that's what you got to do, then that's what's no kink shaming on the Brotherhood without manners <laughs> yeah, is what I think should got, be. That's it. No, that's a new kink rule. Shaming. The new. I'm gonna put that as our new our new catchphrase. Hallelujah. No kink shaming. No kink I dreamt of a maid at a feast with purple serpents in her hair, hmm. venom dripping from their fangs, and later, I dreamt that maid again. Slaying a savage giant in a castle built of snow. Fuck you, Peter <laughs> Baelish! How could you ever think that's anything but what it is? You know what I mean? Like, there are some oh. people that are like, that was foreshadowing for Sansa and her little snow castle. And I'm like, shut nah, the fuck up, not. bitch. You're not reading the same series nah, we're fucking nah. reading. And like, This is the foreshadowing to the foreshadowing that leads to Littlefinger dying and fucking Winterfell and uh, her putting his dumbass head on a spike. Well, wait, so you're saying we don't just take the first three quarters of the prophecy metaphorically and <laughs> part literally? All right, so we call Nate Rhaegar from oh now on. Oh, my God. Well, okay, but, <laughs> but that said, I will say, like, I love that. I don't remember which chapter it is, but you get the chapter of Arya when she hears soon when Joffrey's dead. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and she's like, when she and Sandor are at the pub, that's what it is in a couple chapters. And she's like, Sansa doesn't know any fucking spells. Sansa doesn't know anything except like lemon cakes and brushing her hair and horses and shit. So I'm going to need you to back it up. Sansa would never (laughs) fuck up Joffrey like that. She'd be too fucking cool if she did. (laughs) Right. <laughs> it's exactly that. So Sounds this that cool, dude. This just goes over her head. She's like, huh, I wonder what that could mean. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it's it's such a good it's such a good one because it, it's so easy to just slip right by. Like if you're, you know, on a first time read, like Sansa's already got the hairnet. It's already in place. Dantos is already Yeah, he's already like signing cash and trying to cash the check. Mm-hmm. Like he's ready to go and it's just so brilliant. And then to foreshadow something that we haven't seen yet. Like, th- we're still waiting on this second bit. And god damn it, am I waiting, George? Please, I need to see Sansa just wreck Littlefinger in every way. So, yeah. she finally does a super creepy, just yeah, horror movie I head turn. You. Oh and, my god. like, calls Arya over. With her hair billowing, like, cause it's supposed to be like super windy, right? Like, oh it's yeah, pre storm storming, right? Some here. Galadriel like, bullshit, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Just and she's talking. She mentioned that like her hair is falling out by the handful, so like yes, it's got to be wispy clumps, and yeah. just creepy, old witchy. And, ugh. Fear cuts deeper than swords, Sirio, my boy, coming through. And she approach Arya approaches warily, poised to flee on the balls of her feet. And yeah, I straight up see like. Like Chloe said, Galadriel at this point, because she just like goes from like, oh, I'm seeing this this king's dead, and these people are gonna die, and they're gonna die. Holy Powerful, shit! Yeah. And then like goes in. Uh, she calls her. I, I, she, oh, I have the whole thing out the there. Yeah, yeah. 
I see you. I see you, wolf child, blood child. I thought it was the Lord who smelled of death. She begins to sob, cries racking her little body. You are cruel to come to my hill, cruel. I gorged on grief at Summer Hall. I need none of yours. Be gone from here, dark heart. Be gone. Ugh, man. I mean, oh, just to, oh. like, regard such a little girl with such, you know, superstition and, like, to immediately be that fucking shooked by Arya Stark, like, that's that's scary shit, especially knowing what she's been through, right? Like, especially as we get Jenny's song here and oh. as, like, that's all she wants is to just, like, lay in her sadness. Think of the children that died that day, right? Besides Rhaegar, he got out. But, like, think of how, like, that is the foreshadowing. Old Stones, even though we don't have all the story, like, Jenny of Old Stones coming to be with Dunk the Small. Oh, Dunk the Small. Oh, God. Oh, Dunk, uh, Dunk. Dunk the Small. But then, like, Dunk. Egg and his best friend, Dunk Dor, I mean, Hodor, I mean, Duncan the Tall, <laughs> and getting him out of there and, like, sacrificing himself, but still he blows it all up, probably for some sort of power prophecy bullshit combo. Mm -hmm. Like, that, like, Rob chases his quote-unquote heart and doesn't want to create a bastard thanks to, you know, Cat and Ned's constant quibbles that they thought didn't affect anyone but themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, like, that's the the Jenny of Old Stones and Dunk of Our Time. Like, Jane and Rob is that. And that foreshadowing is so succinctly done here. And to bring up mm. all the old shit that we're talking about, right? Like, Richard Lawnmouth, Robert's Rebellion, Ashara Dane, Barrick, Knighthood. Just all these concepts that we're about to get into that, like, Jenny's song is the perfect illustration as the ghost settles down from her craziness with Arya. That's that's what has me shook here. And, and even more so if this is Richard Lawnmouth. Arya is here on this hill amongst Beric Dondarrion, who has literally had a lance through his fucking chest, a dirk through his eye, he's hung, and it's Arya that this old frail woman is this shook over like, what is in her future right what is in her future besides just genocide that <laughs> has this woman shook like if, if, if zach's fully subscribed yeah to my theory is zach, that Arya, Arya may, may may be the one to blow king's landing the mm. the initial start of her grief the loss of her father that started her on this whole journey that's where cersei is she even says it here the the mountain has more than half of her list are under the mountain and where do we know the mountain to be at the end of the current canon content is robert strong right next to cersei and so i could see Arya slipping in and i could see Arya being the one to be like nope fuck this whole city dog like bye and just blowing the whole thing which would stand to reason that her stench of death would smell a little crazy the dark heart i i just that name sticks with me it's she's uh, already embracing that we can yeah. see that that she's already just by her conversation with the face uh, ned man. have have mm -hmm. you killed anybody yet and he's like i'm 12 and she thinks i was eight when i killed and then she lists them off i killed this dude and i killed that dude I guess I don't really get to count those ones with the weasel soup, but like I guess I kind of killed those dudes too. And I think just... it's the the direct correlation to Summerhall yeah. that that gets me here. A massive fire that mm -hmm. c killed kings, killed princes, princesses. It it was this tragedy, this enormous tragedy that changed the entire fucking realm forever. And I I can only see the equivalent of that being the thing we learned about a couple chapters ago in Jamie, which is there are literal stores of almost nuclear bombs set around King's Landing that put that in anyone's mm -hmm. hands, and that is an extreme power upgrade of, like, <laughs> just push the button, and there goes the capital of the Seven Kingdoms. And it's just, I don't know, Arya... Arya's a tough one. Uh, of course, her Winds of Winter sample chapter, Mercy. Mercy. With the Mercy, 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 uh, very much so plays to your theory that she may have to kill Mama Stark, Rip. which uh, I think it would have to be one or the other. And honestly, I think I do like her putting Mama Stark down a little better than... But you know, I have to say the one thing... I hate to hand it to him. You do not have to hand it to David and Dan. I just want to make sure that's said loudly, you know. But the bad show did 
of all the characters in the last few seasons, the only character that had a fucking cohesive and fulfilling arc was Arya. And her mm. performance in the bells, right? Her characterization in the bells, her being on the ground, trying to get people out and uh, being with the small folk and being, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, watching the people she's trying to save just get fucking exploded in front of her. Right. I-, I could see where that could happen. I do think that when King's Landing blows, it has to be from a certain person there whose plot is directly connected to her family and King's Landing and things being made for them that may or not be under, you know. (laughs) Anyways, but uh, (laughs) anyways, so what I'm saying is like, I I love how she was there in the bad show and I'm trying to cohesively figure out how she'll be there in the books Mm -hmm. if she could. But if she could be there, that'd be great. Like, I think that would be awesome. I do think Riverlands is like, She's more of the Riverlands than Sansa is, sure. if that makes mm-hmm. sense. And like, I think Sansa's plot is very much not going to be focused in the Riverlands, which is interesting because reading Catalan's POV alone really brought up how important the Riverlands was made during all of this. Uh, and if any character left still has that connection, I think, especially with the Old Stone stuff here and with the Ghost of High Heart, I think, I think Arya is the most connected. You know, sure. we've always said that just starting from Game of Thrones when they're traveling down the King's Road, she's the one that's off in the woods and playing yes. out off to the sides. So she always had that inherent like. Right. Not even I in a negative being... against Sansa. Yeah. Sansa no, just she just has interest. other things. Like, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. She just well, has, and so what's that line from Jenna? Be... Right. Like Tyrion, I've been or Jamie, I've been trying to say Tyrion is your father's son. Like Arya is Catelyn's daughter. You know, that that's it. That's right. it. She's Catelyn writ small. Yeah, she's Catelyn writ small, and that's like the one thing she kind of, especially throughout her storm arc, right? She's like, "What if my mom doesn't want me back, you guys? Mm, like, what if my mom mm-hmm. doesn't fucking want me? That's horrible." She does kind of mention it towards the end of this, where she's like, "Well, Rob won't pay." Well, that for was me. just in the last chapter. Yeah, where she's seven. Like, yeah, will they even will they even ransom me back? Because my hair is dirty. I fucking killed people. Like my 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 feet are so calloused that they're hard and oh gross. honey like all your mom yeah, wanted bro, was you back baby, yeah, bro, all your all mom wanted wants. all she would have traded the world just for you back she holy traded, shit she, she, she did, did. She fuck <laughs> <laughs> the series is so bullshit good. we just did the red wedding like last week so i'm a little tender is what i'm trying <laughs> to say <laughs> <laughs> jump jump right back into the build-up god me, it's fine can we talk about so, edric let's talk about Edric. Yeah, we're getting there. Let's uh so <laughs> It hurts. <laughs> Thoros comes in defending Arya from, from the fine. witch. Yeah. And Lem doesn't agree as he points to his busted nose from where she, you know, busted his nose. And they tell her like Arya's oh, she'll be gone in the morning. Chill. She's not gonna slaughter millions tonight. We'll we'll get her out of your hair and you can relax. We're taking her to River Run to her mother. <laughs> no, you ain't Mm-mm. liars. Nah. <laughs> Black fi- the Blackfish holds the rivers now If you wish to find the mother You must seek her at the twins There is to be a wedding Look in your flames, pink priest You'll see, though not now Not here This place belongs to the old gods still And they remember And have no love of fire So we get a lot of interesting The Andals of the The, the Andals and the First Men came With fire in their fists And took down these weirwood trees and you know the north remembers is very commonly quoted saying but uh apparently the old gods do as well because which could very well just be the the way that the the westerosi society has taken that it, maybe it always was the old gods remember and they're like nah the, the north is the old gods and so yeah the north remembers and it just kind of inherently evolved into that over time sure division of religion type of thing. Yeah, but then... Um, Lem is woken, because he needs to sing her a song. Right. And, of course, Tom. she requests... Tom is woken. Tom, sorry, yep. Wow, Lem's fake nerd here. boys. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 Shit, cancel the podcast. Oh, Nate, shut God. it down. <laughs> Damn it, Chloe, you're on one episode, 182 episodes, out the fucking window. Out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Tom is woken, and of course she requests my Jenny's song, and she rocks as it's sang back and forth, and sings along with it, and cries, and so does Zach. Zach uses this song a lot for our, our Dungeons and Dragons games. Well, the when he's the writing, show version, the bad show and version. He's 
so I hear this song a lot, and uh, I love it. Sometimes I forget where it it comes from and what it's, because you know at this point it's so correlated with all these other stories and things that we do. But it's just like thinking of, because it makes you, it really puts you into besides all the people that died at Summer Hall, like how she's lived with it for so long. She's the only one left alone. Unless, you know, Rhaegar's chilling with her. Maybe he visits sometimes. Rhaegar's cold hands. That's not... Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I'd like to throw out anybody's <laughs> cold hands. Yeah, face. I should at least explain this one a little First bit. First of all, Rhaegar is Mance, so jot that down. No, I'm just kidding. Mance Rhaegar. No, oh, I uh, shit. I made a bold statement in, like, our second episode ever that Garrett was cold hands. Two or three episodes before, it was confirmed that his head was sent back to, you know identifiable places and yeah. so now I like to throw out whatever one pisses Zach off the most this week so I don't think Rhaegar is cold hands he probably does at some point maybe he could so be. Thoros takes Arya aside and Arya's like yo my mom's at River Run like what what is she true like who is this crazy old lady and he's like yeah it's alright wherever she is Lord Barrack will find her don't don't worry about it oh he will and so, okay ah uh... Ah! The skies open up, the dwarf woman vanishes, and come morning, Ned, Lem, and Watty the Miller are all sick. I got the sniffles, man. I mean... They should have masked up. If they weren't laying so close to each other and they social distanced right there... This brotherhood is a super spreader, you know what I mean? A superman spreader. (laughs) A superman spreader is going on out here. Right, right. And they... (laughs) Superman spreader. Uh, Damn. (laughs) It's a brotherhood, right? (laughs) So good. So, uh, half a day's ride, there is an abandoned village, a better shelter to wait out the rains, and so they set off, and the rain does not let up. It is fucking brutal, and more people start coughing, and Arya notes that poor little Ned is just miserable. Mm, Poor Ned. Oh. And I love it because he complains that the rain patters on his helm and that gives him headaches. But without his helm, the wet hair gets in his face and mouth and he's not really sure what to do. And Gendry's like, hey, bruh, bruh, you got a knife, right? Just cut your hair, dude. Just cut your hair, dude. That's some it's Samson that shit. Do. He's like anything to make Arya like me more than you. <laughs> boys, boys, it's okay. The boys. There's enough of Arya to go around, okay? She can have two boyfriends. Liana had right. two boyfriends, and that worked out great. The I mean, is, can Rhaegar. Can them handle her? No, absolutely <laughs> not. Really handle them? No, both. absolutely like, that's not. That's no problem. I think that was the problem with Liana, Rhaegar, Robert. This is Liana, Rhaegar, Robert all over again. Right. Literally, that's what this is. Absolutely. Brit Small. Yep. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, yeah, this is where Arya's like, oh, Gendry doesn't like Ned very much. And she's like, he seems all right to me. Although Arya needs to check her privilege Jealous. a little bit here because she's like, although he's not like the typical stereotypes I hear of Dornishmen. And like, all right, Arya. Eh. Especially since we just got a lot of how Joffrey was doing that down south mm. when Oberon showed up. How well, he was... in that chapter, we specifically get the three different types of Dornishmen, the right. Sandy, the Stony, and the Salty. The Salty, the, the salty yeah. right. And uh, Tyrion made the jest as he finally left Oberon that he made a a Dornishman joke, but he was complaining at the beginning of that chapter that Joffrey's been walking around hearing all these jokes about them and thinking he's the cleverest little shit because he can repeat them back. (laughs) Fucking Joffrey. And so it's it's almost strange to see that coming from from her down here. Like, that similar... Mm. She's compared to Joffrey in this, and like I mean, it's not a good look. It's also though, to be fair, like she's just kind of surprised. Which what's interesting, I just want to say, it's interesting that she thinks that they're small and swarthy with like dark hair and small dark eyes. Mm. It almost reminds me a little bit of the Cranog men. Mm-hmm. They sound a lot like the Cranog mm-hmm. men, the same guerrilla warfare that she's hearing about and how small they are and et cetera. Interesting. Just really interesting parallels between the Dornish right, yeah, yeah. and the Cranog. Yeah. You know, I just, I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> Maybe they could really appreciate one another. Well, I mean, we were talking about, you know, characters coming back from that E-list, that era. Where's Howlin' Reed when you need him? First of all, he's a celebrity. Okay, yeah, this? what the fuck? Thank you. Oh my god. <laughs> Thank you so much, because I was like, excuse me, what the fuck? The first time you come to blow the fuck? <laughs> E-list? Fuck out of here. Oh, what the dude. fuck does that mean? Who? Oh. How dare you? Who do you think Howlin' Reed is? What? 
Is he going to be able to live up to his expectations? Yes, that's why he won't show up until the very last book for, like, one chapter. Duh! Duh! Duh. Jesus Christ. And with his wife, Ashara, I mean, Gianna Reed. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I can't believe you just said E-lister. What the fuck? I thought I knew you, man. I thought you were good people. I don't... (laughs) I don't I'm know sorry. about this I'm whole podcast. On behalf of the whole brotherhood, Chloe, I need to apologize. Look, 50% of the Superman spreaders are all right, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, to take uh, Ned's mind off of his misery, <laughs> Arya asks how long he has squired for Lord Beric. And <laughs> long he says, enough. Well, he, he took me when he espoused my wife, uh, a page at seven, a squire at ten. And he says, well, and once I, I run, won a prize riding at the rings. And Arya's like, yeah, I never learned the lance, but I would kill you with a sword. And just, I love George's little kid banter. It's just so good. It's so quick. It's so, yeah, but here's what I can do. And here's how I would be better at it than you. And it's just. It's so Arya. funny that he's not confident in his little kid writing. You know, like he's said in interviews, he's like, I have the hardest time with the youngest children in the series. Mm-hmm. They're hard to write for me. And I'm like, you nail it, dude. Cause mm-hmm. it's funny. Cause it might, it, granted, I'm not much of a writer, but Zach does writing. Like I mentioned, and mm. he's mentioned that specifically for our D and D campaigns when he's writing children that he finds it tough. It's very and hard like, to get into the mindset of a child. They always seem to come off fairly well as, you know, characters written. So I've never quite understood where he's coming from with it being that difficult because he he portrays them well he gets them out there well just like martin it, thanks george maybe it's just that kind of a a thing with not being able to get back into that that mindset of that naive you know and i think he gets around world. that right by like writing super freak children right like he's mm-hmm. like i'm a fucking warg i'm a fucking killer like <laughs> they're not like your normal little 11 and 8 and 13 year olds right like they're a little different well, let's twist them so that way it's okay if i don't if i that. fuck it up no one's gonna notice right. yeah which i i mean right. that's a real thing right like we all Absolutely. compensate in those ways like if i just fuck mm-hmm. things up in this way no one can actually judge my work so i gotta respect that you, you gotta respect these like what if i put a twist on it so no one knows lol <laughs> it works yeah i think it's great i do and, and, and then, you get the fucked up shit with ned now right that's again the fucked up right. shit for aria you're not normal yeah aria her next have you killed anyone and ned like startles at this he's like i'm i'm 12 dude <laughs> like uh, yeah, and that's like we mentioned. She she's immediately. When I was killing people when I was eight. I killed you know the stable boy and that guard, and she just lists them all off, getting crazy. Um, yeah, she she's like, but you've been in battles though, right? Like you've you've actually fought. And he was like, yeah, I was at the Mummers Ford, and she notes here that he doesn't sound proud about it. So he's Chloe basically pulling the role of Nymeria here, right? He, pulling Beric out of the river. Bar- yup, a hundred percent. Yeah, the parallel, and then yep. standing over it in is, this defensive it's position. Ned's, it's Ned pulling Beric out so that Beric wow. can give the kiss of life to cat and it's a uh, you know it, beautiful it makes me think though of arthur dane dying a little bit like it just reminds me of how you know he died at the tower of joy as the savior was born and so here ned is doing some savior shit of like he doesn't die but he pulls someone out of the river you know mm-hmm. to save them that basically sets off like the fucking savior the shit shame. <laughs> yeah motherfucking savior ass magic shit so like that's a really it, it mystical is. dane role right like that it's, feels big it's it's weird you brought up his uh, Dane's death because I with these weirwood stumps I can't get the image of like Carnes out of my head mm-hmm. and we know that Ned Stark ripped down the Tower of Joy to build Car- and they just these stumps these these weirwood stumps feel representative of graves deaths to me. yeah and, and and it's just it's such with <sighs> that's good with Edric Dane and all of these different things coming to the surface it's just. The ties to that exact event, this that's what this is all doing. It's repeating itself. People are living these same roles. It's the we rebellion, dude, all over again. Right, having, as you said, Liana, Robert, and fucking Rhaegar fighting for love right now between Arya, Edric, and Gendry. It's it's nuts. And so, yeah, I just, I thought it was funny you brought up Arthur Dane's death because I just think of the Carns that Ned Stark made for the, the men that died at the Tower of Joy, and that's all I could think of with these stumps is that they're carns of some sort. They're, they're like yeah. there's. It feels like death is on this hill, 
in whatever capacity. Not necessarily negative, not necessarily positive. It just is. And it's such a overwhelming presence. It's just sadness, chapter, right? Like, it's just right. like at Old Stones with Cat and Rob. Like, it, it's just this eerie sadness of history and of the future as the Ghost of High Heart is giving us the future. Uh, mm. God, yeah, I love that. I love that Karns is Graves thing. And uh, Arya's thinking about other deaths, right? Like, she's <laughs> she, as he's saying this, she's thinking, as you said, of all those deaths, the stable boy and the guard at Harrenhal... And the hold fast at the lake with Sir Amory's men. Uh, and then she realizes the connection between names, right? She's like, wait a second. No wonder I like you. You remind me of my daddy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Or my dad's best like, friend, well, Gendry. Well, yeah, duh. <laughs> And then I love how I love how simple Edric is because he's like, yeah, I saw saw your dad at the hands tournament, and I wanted to speak to him, but I couldn't think of anything cool to say, oh so I God. just kind of waved awkwardly at him <laughs> as he rode by, but he didn't even see me and wave back. Do you guys watch Bob's Burgers? Mm-hmm. Why is Edric Dane just regular size Rudy and she's Louise? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's all it is. Oh my God! <laughs> I, I love it. He's on his inhaler. He's like, and then I had to pull Barrack out of the river. Uh, it's okay, Louise. It's okay. Oh, man. Uh, and then, yeah, he's like, I saw your sister there. Loris gave her a rose. Were you there? Like, this, you know, he has no idea, one, that, of co- and how could he? Of course, that thinking of this just brings up that grief for Arya of losing her father and all the horrible things that occurred in King's Landing, Cereal Pharrell dying, all that stuff, but... I like that she specifically notes it See, all seemed so long ago. Mm-hmm. Because at this point, Arya's had four or five different identities she's gone by between Harrenhal and the road with the the Night's Watch. And it was. It, it was long. You were a different person. Each one of the Stark children were different at that point, at the Hands Tournament. Sansa was still into the songs in the... In the, the rose-colored glasses of this is court this is beautiful now you know she's like fuck that shit this place sucks get me home and similar with Arya back then it was my lessons with Sirio that is the most important thing I and you know my father's to be off fair she'd be almost kind of up shit's creek without those lessons because mm-hmm. those mantras kept her moving along oh yeah there's the no negative here so. I'm just saying it's a you know she she was they were all taking it for granted and that's not a judgment on them it's just, you know, she would have gone and hugged her father more and said, how was your day as Hand of the King today? If she had known that Ned Stark was going to get his head chopped off. And it's just that it's so long ago is such a sad, sad statement to be coming from a 10 year old little girl who has not stopped fleeing since her father lost yeah. his head. And it's just that she shouldn't be carrying this weight. This is this is unfair. And obviously it's unfair because then. We get mention of one of the most unfair cases in the books, <laughs> Jane Poole, who fell in love with Beric when she saw him, Sansa's friend. And Jane Poole, as we all know, has some awful atrocities committed on her by one, Peter Baelish, who sells her into disgusting sex trafficking, and then... Fuck Peter Baelish. Fuck Peter Which Baelish. We got, <laughs> Peter Baelish. we got the word about him in the... The bathhouse chapter, yeah. right? About so, but that was so uh, recent, selling. right? So not just that, but then in this chapter later, we're gonna get the line where he's like, "Would your uncle Brendan know you by face?" And she goes, "No." There you mm-hmm. have it. No one knows what Arya Stark looks right. like, and that's why it's yeah, so right. easy to get away with Jane. Mm-hmm. Poor Jane. Ugh. Ugh. Poor Jane. Oh man, let's because uh, uh, she's just mentioned briefly there, and so so Ned's like, "Hey." Uh, what about, what about this Jon Snow guy? <laughs> he's cool, huh? And uh, Arya's like, he's on the wall. He's at the Night's Watch, you know? And then she thinks, oh, wait, maybe I should go to Jon, because Jon loves me, and, like, he wouldn't care how many people I've killed or how messed up my hair is, which is... Uh, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He'd mess up your hair and call you little sister and... Uh, oh, well. And... Oh, well. <laughs> he, t- <laughs> he tells uh, Arya that they were milk brothers and she's like you're not brothers that doesn't make any sense brothers uh, which i always like when she does that shit how she like she immediately assumes like when she puts her no you're wrong that's uh-huh. not true and he's like no 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 like like 
We shared milk as babies. We were milk brothers, not blood. We're not actually brothers. Willa was my wet nurse, and that's Jon Snow's mother. And Arya's like, uh, Jon doesn't know his mom, so, like, are you fucking with me? Or... And she tells him straight up, she's like, I will punch you in the face if you're fucking with me, so... <laughs> and this is the reveal where he's like, "Nah, I swear on my house's honor." And she's like, "You have a house?" And he's he he just kind of looks at her and she's like, "Wait, who who are you?" And we get the the George reveal of he is Sir Edric, not Sir, he's not a knight, uh, Edric Dane of Starfall, the heir to Starfall. And Gendry immediately groans and fucking high lords. High lords. Uh. Oh, sorry, he chucks a crab apple at him. Yeah, right. You're such a sourpuss. Like they're just talking and it's cute. Arya hasn't had someone of age to like just chat with, like kind of just on the level in you know, a good while. Get okay, classist. Whoa, 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 classist. Oh, first of all, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is a certain extent to that. Like we do have to be obviously a little cognizant of like. There's a little class. Like Arya's like, oh, yeah. I haven't talked to anyone like you in a while. Haha. <laughs> Who's like highborn oh, and sure. has courtesies, but it- it's really interesting because as he says that. He was born 287, right? John would have been born 283. So John's four years old. So how are you milk brothers? That would mean John mm. stayed there for how long? That doesn't Robert make Aaron. sense. That makes no sense. That makes no literal right. sense. Like, how long is he going to sit there on a tee? Right. Like, that's a bit old. John like, came home. Old, John came like, back to Winterfell by 284. Right. But, but, but what? Way, way old than that. So hold on a minute. Wait a second. But that's why I'm like, so I mean, he has to mean it's separate, right? Like, he has to mean, like, John was also sucking at my chick Wyla's tit once upon a time, not simultaneously. And here's right, the deal. That's how George I is doing this on purpose. Say, like, he's saying yeah, that she's, we're having this conversation because George wants us to. Like, he's like, oh, yeah, it is confusing, bitch, isn't it? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right. Ed, Edric even says she's been in our service for years. And so I think it's more that. John was mm. born and then, you know, at her tea, and then when he was weaned and taken back to Winterfell. Um, so... Yeah, they, Arya, one, I think endearingly, wants to remember the name Willa so she can tell John whenever <laughs> she sees him next. And then we get mention of Ashara Dane. And uh, I think it's real interesting because the immediate parallel that I want to draw is Edric's sort of confusion that Arya doesn't really know Ashara Dane's name offhand. Mm-hmm. And this is very similar to Jojen and Mira saying... Bran, are you sure you've never heard the Night of the Laughing Tree story? Are you positive you've never heard the Night of the Laughing Tree story? Your father never fucking told you this story? It's kind of the same thing happening here, which is intentional. George is saying these fucking events are tied together. Wait, are anyway. you talking about when Mira in, if I'm not mistaken, this is Bran 2 in A Clash of Kings, or no, I'm sorry, A Storm of Swords, but if, if I'm not mistaken, are you talking about when Mira then goes into talking about how the Cranog man watched a girl with purple eyes dance with seven different partners. And then he talks about these partners what? in detail as the girl with the purple laughing eyes. Also, side note, he's the only character in the series to call her eyes laughing instead of haunted. Anyways, not side note, <laughs> uh, but you're talking about that, right? I would be. Yes, oh, OK, yes, good. That's what I'm I was just making sure. Continue. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. Clarification is good. Um... Arya gets pissed here because Ned tells her that Ashara and Ned Sark were in love. And and pure as day, that's it. He puts it out there. And Arya ain't having it. He loved my lady mother. Yada, yada, yada. And Gendry's like, yo, at least Ned raised his bastard. Ayy! And we get a lot of fun comparisons because Gendry's like, oh, he's probably a bloody drunk, which, yes, he was. And, you know, he's probably dead somewhere. Yes, he is. Like, you know, a lot of, George was having a lot of fun with that little Gendry paragraph there. but uh, You know, there's another thing I have to bring up from our favorite book, A Feast for Crows. Right, boys? Yes. And... Oh, yeah. Good. I was just testing you because I'm still not sure about you, Nate. I'm, not, I'm just not. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, you know, in Cat of the Canals, Arya hears a song. I think it's Darren playing a song about a lady throwing herself off a tower. Mm-hmm. Ah, it's about Ashara there, too. It's about Ashara there, too. Uh, it's So, do you subscribe to the theory that Ned Stark spread the Ashara Dane rumor himself? Yeah, dude. So, listen, Ashara Dane, I've heard about her before, you know, a couple times. And... Sure. <laughs> she, uh... <laughs> 
You know, it's interesting because she's literally a purple herring, right? Think about it. So, look, we're all adults here. We can all subscribe to the the, the truth that Rhaegar and Lyanna equals Jon Snow. We're adults. Right, we know that's the truth. There's no reason to sugarcoat that. But Ashara's the perfect cover, right? If the seed is strong, which was obviously a big deal in the first book for a reason because of Robert and Cersei's incest, but it's also kind of a Jon Snow signifier, right? Like Rhaegar and Lyanna, Jon's hair came out black, Jon's eyes came out gray. He has a stark look. But if he didn't, if he came out with seed strong black hair with purple eyes, that's not a stark color. That's a little, that could be bad, right? That's, that's not good. Um, and so Ashara's the perfect herring. Like, she's the perfect scapegoat for the whole story. Ashara Dane died so the story could live, right? Like, without Ashara Dane, it, it, this all is providing so much conflict to these ideas that are presented about Ashara because in Clash, we learn Kat believes those rumors that Ashara was John's mom and that Ned reacted pretty strongly, I would say. He was like, don't ever ask me about Ashara Dane again. And like, right. uh, if your your hubby says that to you, you got to back off a little. You're like, you're like okay, that's kind of crazy. I'll just back off and never <laughs> ask again and build like resentment about it. That'll be fun for us. It'll be a fun experiment. Uh, Kat didn't deserve it. She didn't. You know, someone should have told that girl. I worry about her. I'm worried about her in the end of this story. You know, I'm kind of worried about that girl. Uh, but she'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you get to Brand 2 and Storm, like we talked about, and we watch from Howland's eyes through his daughter. I don't know why Howland told his daughter, Mira, this very extravagant story where he watched this woman with purple eyes dance with seven men and then names each man and explains everything wrong with them to her. <laughs> I don't understand it. I don't get it. I do get it. It's because they're in love. And... Uh, <laughs> you know, the rumors go on with Harwin after this, right? Because Harwin and Ned both are like, oh, yeah, Ned totally wanted to fuck that girl. Like, he was, like, mm-hmm. into it. But then we get Barristan later in The Kingbreaker, and Barristan gives us some shit that, like, really fucks the timeline up. And he's like, Ashara's daughter had been stillborn, and she threw herself from a tower, mad with grief for the child she lost, and perhaps for the man who dishonored her at Harrenhal. And he's like, blah, 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 I love her, which I shouldn't, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And then he's like, if I had unhorsed Rhaegar at the tourney and crowned Ashara the queen of love and beauty, would she have looked to me instead of Stark? Which adds all of these parameters around this information, right? Like, first of all, everyone's like ashara looked to brandon and she fucked brandon because brandon's a total horn dog like everyone's like brandon fucked brandon fucks so like ashara's hot i bet he fucked her no that doesn't make sense if he did good for them it was probably really spicy i would watch it uh had he not though like so had she fucked him and had his stillborn child for that to be true she would have had to fuck him in Harrenhal because the text states that she was at court for like six months when Elia came to court with handmaidens and then left. So she left mm. like after the tourney a few months later. So, so she comes to the capital for the tourney. She leaves within six months later. Could have been pregnant. We don't know. That's late 281 AC though. The tourney was like in the spring of 281, the fall spring. So by the end of the year, She's showing. She's prego. Whatever. We don't know. This is just speculation. She would have gone yeah, home. That gives to the story more credence that that's Jon Snow floating around. Well, no, it doesn't, though. Pregnant. No, it doesn't. But no, wait, wait. She's, she's, I'm just because saying, listen, no. listen, no, because women don't get pregnant for more than nine months usually. So like for two years, why would you be pregnant for two years? Isn't that a little confusing? Because Jon Snow was born in 283. He was born in the summer of 69 here. Okay, so 283. Thank you. You get me, Zach. Uh, so you'll <laughs> you'll find from our listener inductee that we read later during the small council that we're horrible with years uh-huh. and ages. And so you're correct. Forgive me for my No, I'm just that saying, like, that's not scientifically. That and I know this, like, you know, some people have those sexy, spicy takes, like, a swath is sci-fi. It's not. But if it was, <laughs> it has some sci-fi elements. It's a high fantasy. But uh, some people think that. So maybe in like this different planet and maybe Westeros Planetos operates differently. But if she left at 281, she would have had the baby like 281 early latest. Okay. So, or 282, sorry, latest. I don't know math. I'm drinking whiskey. And 283 (laughs) is when Ned marries Kat. Ned does Battle of the Bells. Later in the summer, Ned goes to Tower of Joy. So like that doesn't, 
it doesn't fucking mesh, right? They don't go to Starfall even until 283, which is when she kills herself. So why'd you wait two years to kill yourself? I'm sorry, that's cruel. So, yeah. But, like... So that... That doesn't make sense. The only other... The only other jump... uh, Jumping off or perceived jumping off of a tower, other than, like, in history with, uh... What didn't what Helena happened? and uh, Helena, yeah. then you have di- or her daughter Jahira as well. That was the crying, yeah, the tears, crying Alyssa's, Alyssa's tears, yeah, Alyssa's yep. Uh, Alyssa's tears. But more recently in our our timeline, it would be was it Courtney Penrose who was thrown off the the thing by some magical issues quote, potentially, quote unquote. And so that just make if that's what's being rumored. Oh well, he he threw himself off. He said fuck that. Is there any potential that Ashara was thrown off? Yeah, like she was club-footed, like she was straight up pushed Mm -hmm. off. Because, I mean, like, you've got, like, you've got in history in the Dance of the Dragons, to keep it topical, because that's really relevant these days, uh, because the hit HBO experience, House of the Dragon, and (laughs) uh, to keep keep it relevant, though, like, you have uh, Helena, who's married to Aegon II in Aeswath history, and she kills herself and impales herself blind mag repo style on the spikes on the fence. And then her daughter, Jahara, ends up doing the same, which is like kind of like, that's weird. But okay, maybe they both really, mm. you know, like maybe, but interesting. Like it's left vague on purpose. George wants cool you. Yeah, he wants you to be like, what is going on with all these ladies George keeps murdering? Um, and I think, I think they're still like, like I, I mean, look, the Tower of Joy was a cover up. I mean, look, me and, me and Zach talked about it. Like, it, it was a cover-up. That's what we just decided. Like, how do you dig that many cairns? Okay, how do you dig all those graves with Fetty. two? You have Howl and Reed and Ned. Ned Stark how do you do that? See? How are they doing it? Nate, what I'm saying is you really need to work on opening his tinfoil because it's there. Like, I brought it out. Where have you been? You okay. Know, I, I've been getting shot down because he doesn't like tinfoil. You know, all right, uh, Chloe, I figured out how they did it. They went to the show and they oh my got God. the fucking white wa- the white walkers oh chains God. that they pulled the dra- that's ah. how they got the fucking tower of joy pulled down they just it all makes so much sense when yep, you put it this way they have to way. cross um, as you're a fan of saying on your wonderful podcast the the uh show that these books are based on it's true uh, that's that's probably <laughs> how he did it you know they're gonna need that chain again also, but, you know, they had it's... a baby, is the other thing with them. So, like, not only... They also went back and dug all these graves with a baby. In the door in a sheet. Yeah, I'm I'm just calling bullshit. That's all I'm going to put out yeah, there. I no, mean, yeah, no. I'm not a huge tinfoiler. Like, I have a few ideas and thoughts. And we're going to talk about Illyria Dane in a minute, too, because I think she will have her time to shine in the books. Like, But I think Ashara's out there, bro. I think that Ashara's out there. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, so, George said her body was never found. True. Do you think she's the Brendan Rivers of the desert? So she's got, like, the children of the desert down there digging cairns for, for everybody? No, she's in the fucking shit. neck. She's making out with Howlin' Reed. She's the mother of Jojen <laughs> and Mira. That's where she is. Come on now. <sighs> no, but it's true. Like, Brand, look at the, and her the magic. Is so, Mira, yeah. yeah, that is actually like that's right here. That cute little story of like Ned and Ashara had the hots for each other. It's mm-hmm. Bran and Bran and Mira. Like that's that's literally the same idea. But it, the perfect couple. Oh, that makes it even sweeter seeing them. There. Oh, I can't. I can't with. That. I mean, so we went tangenting. Yeah, we have. Hard we have. Here. We have. So we should uh, get back to the fact that. Arya doesn't like hearing all this shit about Ashara Dane. Dude, she hates it. Right and she's like, no, you're a fucking liar, and I hate you. I hate you. And she leaves. Yeah, it's a, it's another trait to similarly tie her to Jon Snow. You mm-hmm. don't question Ned Stark's honor. You don't you don't question Dad's honor. Like, Dad is Dad. And, like, fuck you if you're going to question his honor. So she rides up to Angai, the archer. And then gets mad at him because she's like, do all Dornishmen lie? And he's like, yep, but some people say the same thing about us marshers. So, like, what's up? Ned's a good kid. And she's like, nah, fuck you, too. (laughs) So she rides off. She thinks about running. But this is when we get a great description of just how fucking harsh these conditions are. There is no way Arya would escape Mm -hmm. them rushing off here. And it's Harwin who ends up catching her, I guess. He rides up after her to have a little Winterfellian chat. (laughs) And I think it's interesting here because he fucking begs her to leave this alone, mm-hmm. to let it lie. 
And don't question it, he says. Don't question it further. Why that, would he? Is why? The, it's the leftover warning from Daddy Stark. Is that the only thing we think? Is that is that Ned the Stark's only thing we is think? Still holding it. <laughs> is it Zach? Are you asking you or me? It. He was yelling this at me earlier before the episode recorded. Does Harwin like, know? This is bullshit. Like, what the fuck does know. Harwin know that he's like, nah, we don't want this being dug into any deeper? Or is it just that don't mention it to Mama Stark because she'll rip someone's fucking face off over You know, it, there's right? there's this, uh, so there's a whole catalog on Westeros org of So Spake Martins, right? Uh, where George has answered questions and interviews are off. Back in the day before we were all asshole fans, he used to like do AI, AOL chats and shit dude like he used to give us the world back before he was famous so you got to give it up to him but he has said ashara dame was not stapled to the floor during the rebellion and there's a pretty popular theory that she's the one who said hey you know where your sister is ned out here getting fucked at the prince's pass right like she's getting it and she's getting that Azora High, and by Azora High, I mean he's sticking it in Nisa Nisa, right? And she dies, <laughs> but that happens after that. But <laughs> keep up. Um, but like, That's later. That's later. but like, if she got found out giving that information, what do you think Robin would, Robert, Robin, what do you think Robert would do, right? Like, Robert would be Bust like, off a tower. well, right, but that's the thing is like, it's a cover up, it's a fucking cover up. Harwin has an idea. That he probably knows. I mean, Richard Lodmouth is literally right there, dude. Mm. It's a cover up, and all these dead characters are all of a sudden being See, brought to the front. All this shit, but you, you you've been yelling at me about Richard Lodmouth for years, and he's part of this all. He just had to meet me. We're best friends now. It's not a big deal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna be DMing some theories after this. We're gonna get Good. deep. Learn from her. there are I theories like to learn. Have you guys heard of the Heron Hall conspiracies? I don't buy them, but there are some in there that it's like such an out of the box. It's by this user on Reddit, uh, King Littlefinger, and he doesn't even believe his own theories now. Is the funniest <laughs> part. Like most of the people's theories, I love. They're like, oh, I don't buy that shit anymore, and I'm like, no, that's my existence. <laughs> Uh, my life. But he thinks about some of these things so outside the box. And like Ashara, especially as a player, there's this idea he put out there of her dancing with the people at the at the dance, at the feast. Each one she was dancing with, trying to give Rhaegar's coalition to try to overtake his dad and be like, come meet with us, come meet with us. And I'm like, yo, that's brilliant. That is a brilliant reading of the text. Uh, oh. There's so much in this chapter of these players, the the, you know, Richard Lonmouth, Knights and Skulls, Kisses and Wine, all these people coming to the forefront that have been dead for so long. What could it mean? What could it mean? What can it mean? It means Rhaegar's man. No, I'm just kidding. But It means ghosts. <laughs> yeah, it's ghosts. It means John's dire wolf. Yeah, it could. I mean, John is, so, I will say, like, there's that line where Ned was like, you have a baseborn brother, Jon Snow. And then he talks about how Beric was supposed to marry his sister before Beric right. died. That's some foreshadowing, right? Because mm-hmm. Beric had oaths and vows to fulfill, but then he died and now they don't matter and Ned's following him. That's some John shit, right? That's some, I mean. That's all John shit right, right there. John is in this, man. All of them. It's all about John. It's all about the Tower of Joy. It's all about these players involved, and it's all about Johnny Boy. It really fucking is. Like, yeah. goddamn, John. You locked out, boy. So Harwin finally yeah, manages to convince Arya not really of anything. <laughs> he just gets her a little less pissed off. He mentions that, like, he knows the rumors. But you got to remember that Brandon was alive back then. And so it's it's not like he was forsaking any kind of vows because Catelyn was promised to Brandon at the time. So he was free to go. Right. And, if two consenting you know, adults are having a good time, it's no one's fucking business. And there's no harm, no foul. Cat was a spouse to Brandon. Ned wasn't a spouse to anybody, so him and Ashara could have a fling. If not, what does it matter? They're all dead anyway, he says. <laughs> Which, like, Harwin, I'm going to need you to tone it down about four fucking notches, my dude, because, like, I'm not okay with just ripping I'm the band aid off with him like that. On that one, that's, that's a full, like, is, what's it matter? I also think like, that's a big old George wink of like, hey, if you didn't get the ghosts in this this chapter, <laughs> a wink, well, they're all dead. What does it matter? Yet we're still sitting here for, I don't know, what are we at, an hour and a half of discussing these things because they're still prevalent in the fucking current But hey, George. men's lives have meanings, not their death, right? That's the other thing. 
We do learn that. That's how, That's literally the line Catelyn just said to Rob of, I value your life more than the song that we'll be saying about how you died in battle. And yeah, that's... That's some that's, fetus that's and this. Achilles shit right there. You know, like that's mm-hmm. some straight up like, do you want glory or do you want to die young for glory? Or do you want to have, do you want to be a fucking pauper and have family and friends and love and just like loved ones that you can protect? I mean... This world's pretty dog eat wolf or wolf eat dog right now. Mm-hmm. So or oh, lion see. eat. I see what she did there. <laughs> um, but do you know what dogs do to wolves? Mercy, mercy, so, mercy. <clears throat> they finally arrive at Lord Goodbrook's old village, which has been burned down <laughs> by, by Tywin. By, oh wait, no, no sorry, Hoster. No, right? the, yeah, uh, by Hoster. And so I think uh, I had meant to mention this earlier. This Chloe had brought up a, a point, but. The Goodbrooks went over to Robert's side after the war. Yep. And we hear a lot about, from both Fagon, about how there's dragon supporters there just waiting. Just waiting. Are we going to see the, like, we're, again, ghosts and places from the past? This is, yeah. they specifically were burnt down during the rebellion. Uh-huh. 16 years this village has just been chilling uninhabited. Are the Goodbrooks going to make some kind of a, an appearance? We know that Hoster mm. burned them in the name of Robert, but then they were forgiven, and it's again that who holds who accountable, the Bannermen versus the Lord versus the King. and Who makes the where law. Where is it okay? <laughs> and where does power reside? Right. Mm-hmm. Well, and so it's just, are the good brooks going to be somebody that, you know, John Con's looking for, you know, for some support or somebody in the area? But you know, there's a lot more places. You know where they are right now, right? They're under the Lannisters. Davin Lannister, they're supporting Davin Lannister. That's where the good brooks are. That's what it meant for Hoster to burn their village. And that's part of Arya running from this troop, right? Like, she's like, no, my dad could never fuck anyone that wasn't my mom. And that didn't happen either. I never saw it. And you yeah, know. Gendry gives her a look, and she's like, "No, no, don't fucking look at me. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't fuck with fuck. Okay, Gendry, don't look at me. Right. <laughs> and but like that alone, she's like, "No, that could never be true. That's not true. That's a lie." Uh, and then you get this where she's like, "My grandfather, who I didn't know, he wouldn't do that either. Like, they would never kill." And, and that's where it's like Arya's whole arc becomes, especially as she literally gets to Bravos to the actual house of black and white, like things aren't black and white and that's what she learns it's not like you can just kill people or let them live like it's gray in between she learned it when she was like how do i choose these deaths in harrenhal right when she was running from harrenhal the deaths that would have been more purposeful she didn't kill tywin even though she wanted to she chose in the moment survival uh she chose protecting those around her that she could and so seeing that her grandfather you know, ruin these people's livelihoods, like forever, like forever and ever, like forever and ever and, and ever. And turn them against him. He yeah. He an enemy forever. 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 Because they joined yeah. Davin Lannister, which to be fair, he has some sick hair and beard going on because he's like, <laughs> my dad died and I'm never cutting it. And I'm like, that's rock and roll. Very, very rock and roll. Some blonde, like crazy shit going on there with that like crazy beard. But besides that i'm like davin has them under control and he's doing whatever for the lannister regime right now just because that's his family and that's what he should do which maybe that really begs the whole like maybe war is bad and like having houses with arms and you know uh, maybe anyways but you know and maybe george is saying war is bad i couldn't he's saying war is bad george didn't really agree with nam you know he doesn't like war anyways war is bad right but these people, they chose what would feed them, what would nourish them. The Starks aren't out here nourishing them. Hoster Tully isn't out here nourishing them. Rob, the new Tully king, you know, he's got the red hair of the Tullys and he's ruling the Riverlands in the north. They don't give a fuck about him. He's not feeding them. He's dead. I mean... <laughs> the king who lost the north, man. And the Riverlands. He lost them, too. And his life. Yeah, that too, but... yeah. This, this village That's is a nice. very good representation of what Barrick was saying earlier. Fire consumes, yep. and when it's gone, it leaves nothing. And 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 it left these villagers with no no choice. And that's another <laughs> recurring theme of no chance, no choice. Yeah, you gotta go. You gotta go somewhere you can eat. You gotta go with the Lord who's going to provide for you. Hoster Tully failed these people as their liege lord. He fucking burned them out of their homes and so of course they're gonna go to a lord that's going to of course in westeros it's all fucked up so you're kind of it's a crapshoot you're throwing the dice with whatever lord you get mm-hmm. but the, the lannisters right now are feeding and housing and allowing them to live thoros 
stares into the flames, which is just great imagery. You're looking into flames in a burned out village that was consumed by them. And we get a little tale from Tom Seven Strings traveling through the veil, right. getting accosted by some clansmen. He didn't handle it quite as well as Tyrion did and ended up naked besides his harp at the, uh, what was it, the Blood Gate? The Bloody or? Gate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Had to sing a couple songs before they'd let him in. Been there. Naked is his name day. Right. I mean, who hasn't? Sure. Walk of shame, basically. And, yeah, then Thoros starts flipping his shit because he's seen something. Lannisters! Else. Lannisters! Yeah, and he's, yeah he, he books it over to, Red uh, alert. to the gentlemen, the boys. Let's get the boys together and keep this super spreader going. Yeah. Oh, my know? God. So, <laughs> Lem and Tom and... They just um, all start making out, and yeah. it's just fucking hot. All right, you head north and start throwing parties. I'll head west, and we're just going to get it spread yeah, over. Yeah, they're, they're talking. They're throwing looks at Arya, and then they call Arya over, and they tell her that, yeah, River Run's about to be coming under siege, and, like, that sucks. Sorry. And Arya kind of flips out, and they're like, no, your mom may be at the twins. There may be a wedding. We're going to see what we can see. <laughs> it's going to be fun. But, you know. Yeah, it's all good. And Arya's like, fuck all of this noise. I am sick to death of these people lying to me. We're going here. We're going here. Now we're back at this fucking scary hill with the little ghost lady who's yelling <laughs> shit at me. That's scary. Now you're fucking not taking me where you said, like, where we've been trekking through the rain. People are getting sick. This journey has sucked. And now, like, oh, nope, turn around. We're going to go back to the fucking hill or something. <laughs> Who knows? So she books it. And I don't fucking blame her for a goddamn instant. Because I'm done with these liars, too. How could you trust so them? Runs. How could you? You're... It's exhausting. It is. Yeah. Not only is she physically exhausted from the journey, but it's she just learned about, like, Ashara Dane. She's getting all this shit about her father and her mother dumped on her. Her brother, Jon Snow. She thinks she knows some big, great secret that Jon doesn't of his <laughs> mother's name, which isn't even, right, related to fucking anything, but it's a weight on her. Mm-hmm. And now she's got these men that she's trying to trust these were my father's men he sent them out they're knights they're lords they're good men they're Har- freaky zombies raising from the dead they're fire whites you know. right yeah everything uh, i know is a lie <laughs> every everything is a lie and everyone is a liar and i just you know this is the difference between sansa and Arya. is that sansa was told that she needs to start lying and started learning that from the get-go it took Arya this long into Storm of Swords to realize that, yes, she had Sirio's teachings. Everyone is fucking lying always. Just assume that. Just because that's the world we live in at war right now. And Arya is finally just getting it of like, all right, everyone is in it to get what they need out of it. So she books it. Through the trees, she hears them yelling, and maybe it's Gendry after her. Maybe it's Harwin. Maybe it's Ned. Maybe it's Ned. Oh, yeah. my lady lost. No, because he's be about having the rain in his hair. He wouldn't run. run. No, that'd be Gendry. He'd be like, oh, he runs like a fucking All right, jackass. listen, Nedrick, you get your inhaler. Gendry, take a fucking Xanax, okay? <laughs> Jesus, boys. Boys, boys. But I, I do have to say the most exciting part about where she's running, and it's all about freedom, right? Like, Arya has that streak of independence, and, and it's like... After being held captive at Heron Hall and like held captive by these people and like having to live under that, like she's like, no, no one's gonna keep me down. I'm a motherfucking wolf child, which is so funny because then she literally gives up all of her independence and all of her everything to go figure out how to be <laughs> no one. But uh, here she runs into the hands of the next mentor, who is the mentor, as you just said, that taught her sister to lie, right? Because it wasn't Cersei. Who taught her to lie? It was Sandor motherfucking mm. Clegane. And here he is. And he's going to teach Arya mercy. <laughs> so that she can teach it, slash give so it, that, to her, yeah. someone else. <laughs> yeah, it's and yeah, she runs into the waiting hounds of the... Uh, she doesn't know it's him, and I love the way that reveal is done. Of an, Oh, you're hurting me, thinking it's Harwin or Gendry. And then she turns, and he's like, ha, ah, you're mine, bitch. And grabs her and throws her Surprise, up on the horse. motherfucker. Oh, you know, but that's exactly how that moment with him and Sansa went too when he grabs her arm on the serpentine, right? Like she's like, yeah. "You're hurting me." Right. Interesting. I didn't think about that. Mm. Nice. Uh, and there, there you go. She's with Sandor that's now. Arya. That's, that's Arya eight. No, I'm not. I'm I'm far older. But one of the best, I think, chapters that George has written to date 
uh, so as far good. as the history it contains, there is so much fucking history in, I don't know, what, 18 pages, if that, of text, and it's just... As deep as you want to go, you can probably keep even going deeper in it, and that is just phenomenal writing. Yeah. So, with with that, we'll go ahead and convene a small council. Convene a small council we'll, uh, and get some inductees. Some, yeah. Word. And we're back with the small council. Uh, that was a fantastic chapter, one of my favorites. So, so good. we'll jump right into it. Uh, you got an inductee, Nate. Oh, God, no. I never come okay. prepared to these things. Chloe, so. do you have yeah, one Yeah, I've got, like, three. Go Holy right. shit, I've got, She's like, ready. eight. All right. Yeah. There she goes. Uh, Arya's... Have at it, please. Arya's crab apple that she throws at Gendry to... Yes! Yeah, that's an inductee. Wonderful. That right there. Mm-hmm. That's huge. Like, I would throw... That's all... That's better than her orange she throws at Sansa. Mm-hmm. Gendry did rub his eyebrow when she hit him with crab it. Crab apples suck, yo. Yeah, I used yeah. to huck those things as a kid, too. Like, those fucking hurt. I love that she doesn't know, but, like... She doesn't know she loves him, but like that's what that was. She was like, "Fuck off," you know, like "fuck you, dude, leave me alone." Yeah, yeah, the little love triangle, so, so cute. Adorable. I love it. Yeah, it's great. That's a great one, the crab apple. Yeah. yeah. Did you yeah. have others, or I, I have others? What just... But what? Do you... Well, yeah. let us each give yeah. one. Okay, let's and go around. You, so you go first. You uh, go next. She went first. <laughs> Mine's going to Ashara, motherfucking day. Fuck yeah. Um, <laughs> Because of all of this, the the history of it, uh, even even things as simple as like Barristan Selmy's weird crush on her, I love this woman's fucking history and the the bullshit she had to navigate mm-hmm. is just as interesting to me. Uh, she I think is a great kind of parallel to Sansa of this badass woman who needs to try to navigate the fragility of men's egos <laughs> to get anything fucking done in this world. And I think she does. Like, I think, uh, I agree with Chloe. I think Ashara Dane is still alive and is out there in the world somewhere. And it's going to come back and be like, sup, bitch. You can't kill me. <laughs> it's princess in the so, tower Ashara shit. Dane Hell yeah. Me. Princess right. in the tower shit. That's what her, Ariane, Sansa, all of them. Mm. <laughs> Sweet. So then I will go ahead and give mine, hopefully, to redeem myself a little bit, to the one and only Howland Reed. Okay. Yes. For being ever present throughout these ev- this whole book. I mean, he's just popping up everywhere we can. The A list celebrity oh. character from A Storm of Sorns. Oh. Sorns. 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 I'm just so worried. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I've put. Fourth, Howland Reed is like my number one contender in every song of madness that I've participated in in March for Davos Fingers. And like he's he's that was a slip of the tongue. Yeah, I that don't abs- think he's I was gonna e- say like, that absolutely is not you. Like Howland you is one Howland. of my, my favorites of all time. So to be able to sneak him back in here, especially since you were talking about the you know, the prominence of them digging the uh, down the at Karns, the tower drum, yeah. down the car- and and Mira with the story of the night of the laughing tree, laughing skull tree. S- tree. I'm, All. You're I'm a just a mess at this Chloe, point. Chloe, you're it's turning going to... into a mess. Uh, okay. sorry, you're just, you're, I'm sorry. Your <laughs> intelligence. I'm Arya here. Is just oh, God. Me. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, Howland Reed is who I will give my inductee to. Okay. Week. Word. Good one. Um, I believe because we are technically. Recording this episode out of order. No. We did not get to properly request inductees. So we only have one this week for one listener who writes in, you know, six months in advance. Worth of, so we we're going to be reading Kristen. It. So typically we won't read the full email, but because she's the only inductee this week, we'll go ahead and read uh, some of it. She started by saying, I realized in my last or second to last Aria email, I screwed up her age. I guess I'm really a part of the Brotherhood now. <laughs> Good to have you. So her inductee for this chapter is going to be Harwin. Mm. He stepped into an elder brotherly role quite well with Arya when he consoled her about the news about her father, although she's not 100% convinced they're all dead, like he claims. Mm. Like me with Ashara. Yeah. Right, yeah. Kristen, don't play. She knows Kristen some knows, shit, man. Yeah. So Kristen thank you, Kristen. Yeah. We love it when you write in. We appreciate Amazing. your inductee, as always. So... The, any final thoughts? Uh, I mean, no. Well, um, no. Thank you, Chloe. Freaking. You got any final thoughts? Like, this was amazing. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, my favorite chapter, In a Storm of Swords, made 
ten times better because you were here and all your insight was phenomenal. And uh, I love this discussion. I'll stop talking, please. You. No, I've had such a blast, you guys. Thanks so much for having me. It was so fun. Uh, and Arya 8 is one of my favorites. Uh, in A Storm of Swords, you got the brand too. You got the Arya 8. You know, like those two especially. Those are like, mm. look, I'm a, pre- I'm a slut for Priya Song of Ice and Fire. You give me some history and I'm going to go fucking hog wild about it. I just love those little stupid details. So anytime I can talk about a Shardane, I'm into it. And, uh, you know, make sure you guys subscribe to Girls Gone Canon. We cover A Song of Ice and Fire POV by POV. So we only do one POV at a time, their chapters at a time. And it's a really fun way to read. Uh, I really, really recommend it. And you can catch some theories, including an Edric Dane parentage theory that I wrote long mm-hmm. ago. Yes, over at liesandarborgold.com. That's where I keep all my old old essays and you know there there's some and coming so out give me the links we'll have those in the show notes yeah. the episode listeners so. go go read her her blog go listen to girls gone canon it is the way you and eliana put together the episode just focusing on one pov all the way through is such a different insightful way to get into the mindset of just one character's journey and yeah. it's so good you guys are of course super intelligent in what you present about a song of ice and fire i've been super excited to have you on for weeks since it's been planned well and shit so, i mean we've been planning it for a year for at a year. least yeah, so yeah. I mean, this is right been... the pandemic maybe like it's been i've had a uh, date planned with you two for a long time <laughs> and you know <laughs> i'd say this is the yeah. ultimate thruple you know like sorry aria yes. edric and gendry but this is the thruple this is the moment it's brotherhood <laughs> brotherhood without manners the superman spreaders wait no shit brotherhood without no, manners yes, that's our new, <laughs> no, no, it works, it. Yeah. Great. the superman spreaders so, where can everybody find you on the socials? At Lies and Arbor on Twitter. Always out there with them hot tweets. Uh, Liesandarborgold.com. I've got a Tumblr somewhere out there. I don't use it anymore. You can find me on the podcast. You know, we're, we just pay all those tweets now. You know, just listen to the podcast. Right. Give me your time and you can hear some stupid bullshit. I promise you. <laughs> The best kind of stupid bullshit, though. The A Song of Ice and Fire related is stupid Hallelujah. Bullshit. Hallelujah. It's great. <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, as always, you can find us wherever podcasts are. Our website, brotherhoodwithout.com. You can email us in your inductees like Kristen did. www. There's no W's in front of your email. I always fuck that thing up. <laughs> it's withoutmannersbrotherhood at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook. Search for us. We're there somewhere. We're on Patreon, patreon.com slash without manners we hit you with those Duncan egg episodes where ow, we're working ow. our way through drunken egg um i think that's enough yeah. that's all i need to give right now chloe so. please come back someday so that i don't only have to sit here with nate and talk about this wonderful series that is george rr R. martin's books only if you read those essays absolutely you know, that's what i thought now he asked you He's doing <laughs> richard lawnmouth first there we go yeah i'll read it i'll read it yep, amazing i will i'll tweet i'll tweet you when i finish perfect it. well all i'll be right. back then i'll be back Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. With that, we will say goodbye to everybody. Valo de Harris. Peace.